So hello everyone, welcome to Suzycon. Uh How are you doing so far? Good, perfect, thank you for coming. So this is the first session of Suzycon. So <coughs> uh, we will talk about containers and uh, some of the introductory uh, parts. So my name is Michael, I'm product manager at Suze. I have Flavio, he's engineering manager. Uh, we are working on containers and container technologies uh, in the enterprise server in Suze CAS platform. And uh, the session is kind of divided into two parts. So first of all, it's in more in the introduction on what, what containers are, how, how it all started. And we will dive deeper into the details. And we will also show some of the stuff. Uh, so Flavio has got some, some demos prepared. And uh, we'll be able to do it, uh, to do it live if the uh, stuff works. If you have any questions, just raise your hand, shout, stand up, throw something in our direction, <laughs> and uh, we'll try to answer. There will be some space hopefully at the end for questions as well. All right, how it all started. So before I start, uh, who has some experience with containers? A bit. All right. So we might be asking some more questions. So this is just a starter. So who knows this person? Anyone? Guys, it's even written there. <laughs> so this is the guy who got it all started. So this is a person, his name is Malcolm McLean. He actually created the concept of containers be before the uh, Second World War. And he invented uh, the packaging uh, format. So it's like uh, the format of a regular container, which is carried on ships and trucks. And uh, the basic idea is that uh, it's the same component which fits on the truck and on the ship and uh, on, the, on the, all the other trans uh, transport or, or storage uh, facilities. So how does it apply to me or actually to you? So when it comes to software, it runs in all kinds of, uh, all kinds of formats. So this is an illustration of a typical data center, all kinds of applications, different sizes, different formats, multiple components uh, running all, all at once. And uh, you see that it's not very easy to have it in, in some order, manage it, and uh, have, an, have a good overview. So this actually looks way better. And what's the difference? The difference is same size and, uh, and the system, sorting system. So if, uh, if the stuff is sorted into same size boxes, it's much easier to like, uh, know what's going on. And the same applies to software. So if your software, if you can package it in very similar boxes and run it uh, this way, you have a better overview and you can, you can manage it better. And I will show you how and, uh, and why. Why should I care? So why do I care about containers and same sizes in, in a data center in IT today? We have seen some of that in, in our keynote earlier today. So not this one, but this one. This is a picture which I like to show. It's kind of a, uh, it's called split brain or bimodal IT. So you have all the traditional IT on one side, on one side, and on the other side you have all the agile guys and uh, DevOps and all those who are bringing in new components without any approval or, or anything. It's kind of a that shadow IT. And you actually try to, to bridge these together to have, uh, have them talk together. So we have, uh, by mode is called because it's like mode one on one side. It's all the guys who have been doing stuff for years, for ages. It's all the reliable stuff. It's uh, planned, it's long-term projects, and it's all the like structure and what has worked uh, so far very well. But on the other side, you have most two people. So we are coming to your company, they are bringing the open source background, they have experience with various uh, projects, uh, open source projects, they don't really want to have and care about the old time enterprise thinking. Uh, and uh, you need to kind of have these worlds together and uh, work together and collaborate. So it's kind of a bridge you need to build between these two worlds. And uh, there is a research that at least like, it's like 50% of various organizations that have this, this kind of split and would need such a bridge. And uh, that's where actually containers are, are coming into the play. So this is one of the 
frequent situation. So we are developers on one side with operations on the other side. And uh, we are working together in a way that developers develop something, some application. They build it, it works on a laptop. And then they throw over the wall to the poor guys in the operations who have to run it. And the environment is different. It's like on one side, it's developer's notebook. It's uh, like open source uh, distribution. They install it, update it every day, every week. And on the other side, in the enterprise world, it's like enterprise software, it's uh, SLAs, they need to uh, update the different defined points in time. <coughs> there are security constraints, there are management constraints, there are monitoring, audits, and all that stuff. And the environment for that application is very, very different from that developer environment and the enterprise environment. So these two uh, differ a lot. And that's where containers actually help very much because you package this application as a container and as long as you define how that container looks like and what <coughs> does it need, then it doesn't matter that much if you hand it over over a wall and uh, have a same container working on the other side. And there are actually more approaches, so we have continuous integration where this wall kind of disappears to a large extent and it really depends what that uh, company is doing. So containers, what is it? We've been talking about containers quite a bit. So where uh, containers, uh, let me actually go to this slide because it illustrates the stuff better. So it depends on from which point of view you are looking at containers. So if you look at the operations side, so container is an image format, all the tooling around it, it's uh, Linux kernel components uh, and subsystems which make sure that you can run applications isolated in a high density and uh, you can like migrate uh, workloads with the orchestration and stuff like that. If you look at it from the applications point of view, it's more a high level, so it's packaging, you split the applications into different components, you package each component independently as a container, uh, ideally these are, or often these are microservice based applications and uh, it's slightly different view on the same topic. So uh, you are taking advantage of all the container uh, properties to have applications run smoothly, to be able to scale them up, scale them down as needed uh, on demand or based on the workload and uh, be able to ship those applications elsewhere as well. So it's also important. So speaking of containers technology, so uh, underneath, uh, under the hood, uh, there are different implementations of containers. So there is like system containers, application containers. Uh, the difference is whether it uh, actually contains the full system apart from the kernel itself or whether it's application only. So we will be focusing and the vast majority of focus in the container world is application containers because it's where the, there are most advantages. But the system containers also have some, some role in it because, for instance, if you are migrating from virtual machine or physical box to a container, the easiest way is to start with a system container. But the real advantage is really there, so that's uh, where we will, we will focus. Here's how it looks like. So we have a server. Uh, underneath, you have all the operating system, you, know, you have some applications running. And uh, you can see what actually container is implementation wise. So you have, a, uh, in case of virtual machines, you have uh, VMs, you have a hypervisor obviously, you have virtual machine, and the virtual machine is a kernel, guest OS, uh, libraries, binaries, and application itself. So in case of system containers, you eliminate this intermediate layer, that's a hypervisor and a kernel, and all the rest remains the same. And you can actually go even a step further and eliminate the guest OS and only have the application uh, in here. And uh, this way, you can see that uh, the overhead in there is very minimal. So there's host OS, and right under the host OS is the application and all its dependencies running, and that's it. So you have eliminated the hypervisor, kernel, and all the unnecessary stuff from, from in there, and still, uh, you achieve kind of an isolation. So advantages, so the advantage of containers versus uh, like V8 
VMs or versus processes is that there is uh, the isolation in place. So the isolation is not as strong as in case of virtual machines, but on the other hand, it's better than when there are processes running uh, one next to each other on a regular host. It's uh, like one kernel shared across <coughs> all the containers. And the best is that the performance is pretty much the same as uh, with regular processes, regular implementation. And uh, you can see that you gain a lot of flexibility when it comes to isolation and uh, you uh, retain the advantage of performance. So you can do a lot of isolation with, uh, of different services running on each host <coughs> and uh, much more stuff which you get to later. Security, uh, there are some limita limitations when it comes to security and uh, running containers in general. So Linux containers are specifically Linux based. So for instance, you can combine different operating systems. You cannot run Windows containers on top of Linux and vice versa, at least not generally. And there is uh, like a bit of a security, uh, well, I'm, I don't want to say risk, but you need to be con aware and security conscious that there are some constraints you need to uh, implement when looking at containers. Like containers in general don't contain 100%, but if you do stuff right, <coughs> it will be fine in most of the time. So just uh, be, be aware. And there is actually a presentation about uh, security and containers later in the week. So I would definitely recommend uh, to, to join that one to see uh, what to do. And there are some general guidance like uh, don't use root uh, if possible. Don't uh, use updated software patch as much as possible. You can also defer to virtual machines and combine virtual machines and containers together if needed. So far, I have been talking about containers, individual containers running one, two, three on host. But the real advantage is when you are, you are actually orchestrating them. So the real advantage comes when you are running thousands of containers or, or even more. And you can't do it by hand, so that's, there's a framework which is called orchestration. So we focus on, on the most common one, which is called Kubernetes. And that allows you to implement container-based applications for real. So single containers, it's uh, like if you have a container host, you can run containers on it. It makes sense if you, if you run like a bunch of services for testing, for development, for QA and other stuff. But for your application, you need the orchestration. So when you move to orchestrated uh, environments, we have the cast platform for that. There are many presentations uh, going around uh, orchestration and showing uh, how the cast platform operates, what it is. So I'm not going into details here. But you can actually go even a step further. And here I am going back to the bimodal world I shown in the beginning. So we can actually combine the container world using uh, containers and to the CAS platform with a traditional one using virtual machines. And idle platform for that is what we do with uh, the OpenStack Cloud, <coughs> which is kind of a single plane of view across all the resources, hardware, network, compute. And you can partition that environment into, into multiple parts. And some of these parts can be containerized. Some of these parts can have virtual machines. And you can kind of live in, in both worlds at once. All right, so there is way more than containers. So this slide is not supposed to be, to be read. I don't think you can even read it. But it's more to show what's, what's going on. So you have different components. So this is called CNC F landscape. And it shows various like, uh, pieces of a container, container world. So you have stuff like container registry, you have security, you have automation. We have key management and uh, service discovery, orchestration with Kubernetes, and all that stuff. So this is all what has been going on since a couple of years. And you can see there is like a huge uh, ecosystem around containers. And containers and operating system is only the base. So it's the base which is necessary to be there, which needs to be stable. And uh, you can't get away from it. But there is a lot going on. There is another another chart which you can't probably read either. And it shows a path. It's uh, called uh, cloud native uh, trail path or something like that. It shows how you have to go from containerization, containerization 
continuous integration, orchestration, and so on and so on uh, to uh, different areas of container ecosystem. So there is a lot going on. And uh, if you look at various container related sessions at SUSECON, there are many of them. Uh, I will point some, uh, some of them at the end. But with that, I would actually defer to Flavio now to show you some, some of the things. Okay, you're there. Thanks, Michal. So um, during the second part of the presentation, we will dig deeper into, into some, some of the new stuff that is coming up uh, during the next year. Um, but first, we will start by talking about standardization and why this is important. <coughs> standardization started quite some time ago with a project called OCI, Open Container Initiative, that defined two different kinds of specifications. There is a specification about how you are supposed to run a container. Um, so what a container engine is going to expose in terms of an API to consumer in order to start, stop container, remove containers, pull images, <coughs> all these kind of uh, operations. OCI, while defining the specification, also provided uh, an implementation of the specification that is called RUN-C over there. How many of you have ever heard about RUN-C? Okay. Uh, how many of you have been using Docker? All right. So Docker, since quite some time, is using RUN-C. Docker underneath talks with a daemon called ContainerD, and ContainerD then talks uh, with RUN-C. So all the containers that we are spawning using Docker, they're actually started by RUN-C. The second specification is about how container images are built. So how should you, uh, their binary blobs, so how those binary blobs are supposed to be created, how they're supposed to be, um, uh, you know, how do you store metadata information instead of it, like who made it, what is the entry point, who is the maintainer, and also, of course, the most important piece, how is your application packed into that? Uh, again, OCI worked on an image format specification. Uh, there is no uh, reference implementation, as in RunC. There is a set of libraries, though, that a couple of projects are, are using to, to build containers. So this is the part about building containers. This is the part about running containers. So thanks to uh, these two standards, we can avoid vendor locking because everybody implementing this specification can run containers that have been built by another vendor. And everybody who implements the, the image format specification can build containers that can be consumed by all kind of uh, runtimes. Uh, there is also um, no fragmentation, meaning that underneath the container that you're moving around are always the same. You don't have to rebuild the container in order to, to make it uh, consumable by another guy. Uh, it's not like you know with uh, Word documents in the past, for example. And uh, that resulted in a lot of innovation. So there, is, there are other ways, and we're going to talk about that right now, there are other ways to run containers, and there are other ways to build containers. And these ways are, are interesting. Um, so starting from running containers, I divided this line into modes. So you are running containers on a standalone machine, as Mika was saying. So you usually do that using Docker. How many of you have heard about Podman? Okay, how many of you have used Podman? All right, good. So we're going to introduce Podman as part of our offering, as part of the container module of SLES during the next year. I'm going to show you uh, something about that. Uh, then there is container orchestration, so it's nice to run containers on a single machine, but uh, you can achieve way more by having a large fleet of nodes where you can run thousands of containers on top of. And again, as Mika said, we are focusing on Kubernetes. Kubernetes has a so-called <coughs> container runtime interface, which is basically, again, uh, a description of the requirements that the container runtime engine has to fulfill in order to, to be usable by Kubernetes. So in the beginning, Kubernetes was just designed to work with, uh, with Docker as a way to start containers. But more has been done uh, in order to make it pluggable. So Docker can be swapped out 
you can use ContainerD, so you can avoid one layer of abstraction. As I mentioned before, Docker calls ContainerD, but calls run C. Uh, you can just skip Docker and go straight with ContainerD. You can use Cryo, which is another container runtime uh, that is focused on, on using OCI uh, standards. I omitted Rocket, uh, which was the first um, uh, container runtime that actually started this whole standardization process. I, I skip that because both it's it's really nice from a technical point of view. Its adoption has really uh, faded away. So let's talk about Podman. So Podman is basically a drop-in replacement for Docker. Uh, as I said before, it's focused only on, uh, on running containers on a single machine. If you have been using Docker since a long time, you might remember that at one point in time, after the Docker 1.13 release, a lot of things started to show up inside of Docker. You got Swarm, for example. How many of you have ever used Swarm or know what it is? So Swarm was uh, an orchestration, is an orchestration solution that is built into, into Docker. They, they kept adding new and new stuff, uh, which is, of course, uh, cool for them. But um, for, for other use cases, this like orchestrating containers for the ones who are using uh, Kubernetes, having all these features into the daemon is, uh, is not so uh, useful. The other really important thing is uh, there is no daemon. What does it mean? So uh, when you run Docker on your machine, you have a so-called Docker daemon that is running on your machine. This is usually configured to listen over a socket. And then you have to be part of the Docker user group in order to be able to talk uh, to access to this socket. Why that? Because as Mika said, uh, containers do not actually contain that much. And containers are made of kernel features. And so you have to, to have root rights, at least used to have, to need to have root rights, to create containers. And so you couldn't just uh, allow everybody on your system to create containers, because that was kind of giving the key of, of a system to everybody. Uh, has anyone ever, for example, mounted the root file system of this host into a Docker container? You can do that, and then you can change the contents of the host machine from within the container, which of course is something uh, dangerous. So with Podman, we see there is no daemon running. It's uh, running uh, containers using run C. And so as I said before, <coughs> if you're using Docker, you're already using run C. And if you're using Podman, you will be still using run C, which means that you're not going to introduce, expect any kind of regression from how your application is going to behave, which is pretty important. And finally, all the network implementation is implemented using CNI, which is Container Network Interface, which is a uh, standard to, to bring network into containers that is used by different projects like Kubernetes or, or Mesos. That means that you can reuse uh, CNI drivers with Podman as well, which is pretty flexible. Podman, however, introduces also some nice features. So it has the concept of pods. How many of you have used Kubernetes or know what a pod is? All right, good. So a pod uh, is basically a way to group containers to do together. So containers, when running by default, by, by design, they are isolated from each other. They don't see each other unless you, you, know, you, you want that to happen. They are isolated using different features that are built into the kernel, like uh, namespaces to isolate, for example, what, what kind of processes each process, uh, each container can see, or the networking stack is going to be a different one, and so on and so forth. You have C groups then to control the resource access of the containers. Usually each container is separated, but there are cases where it's actually pretty flexible to combine two containers together. Some examples, I'm going to make one of them later with a simple web application, but you can think, for example, about you have a container, and you want to have a so-called sidecar that is like taking the logs that your application running the other container is producing and streaming them to some endpoint, for example. Or you want to have a, an agent that is, uh, for example, injecting network policies or whatever uh, to ensure that uh, all the communication of your application are, are secure, which is, for example, what uh, service mesh like ECOE is doing. Finally, another really interesting point, this has been coming up, building, building, it took quite some time and quite some effort from the whole community 
And I got to say, yeah, I'm also proud to, 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 to say that people working at SUSE contributed to that. Uh, we worked really hard to, to get containers running in rootless mode, meaning that as an unprivileged user, you can create <coughs> containers. And this is a really nice way to run containers in a more secure way. You don't have to worry about who's going to, to run them on your machine. Of course, there are limitations. There are trade-offs. But for common usage, these are pretty, pretty nice. Second part is building containers. So I guess how many people have built a container in their life? All right. And I guess you use Docker build, right? Is there anybody who uses something different than Docker build? Oh, cool. OK. Uh, I will talk about different things. So I will talk about Builder. <coughs> Did you use Builder? All right. I will talk about Kiwi. All right. Uh, there was another one. What did you use that I didn't mention? What did I forget about? Did I forget about something? No. Kind of cheating because I was mentioning Podman. Ah, okay, Podman. OK, good. Oh, I mentioned that. Good. So basically, um, building containers. So usually you use Docker build. With Docker build, you start from an existing image. And then you customize that. You keep adding stuff on top of it. Uh, but as I just mentioned, I already you know, mentioned that all the projects, there are different ways to, to build containers. And I will tell you something. If you have been using uh, something containerized by SUSE, this container was not built with Docker build. Uh, but it still works with your Docker engine. So how so? I mean, uh, how this magic is working? Well, again, uh, standard matters. So all the containers that we're building, we're building them following the OCI format specification. And so by doing that, you build a container with uh, Docker, Podman, Builda, Kiwi, whatever, and then you can run that with any of the container engines that are following the image runtime specification. So building with Docker, pretty easy. You start from an existing container, you write a so-called Docker file, and inside of the Docker file you have a set of directives. The most used one is run. Run is going to execute the program inside of the container uh, during the build process. And usually do that to do like uh, using the package manager to do a zipper in of the package, apt get in, whatever. You do a make, all this kind of <coughs> stuff. You can also uh, write metadata inside of the Docker file life. The maintainer of the image is this guy. This image is going to uh, run a service on these ports. And it needs volume, so on and so forth. So pretty straightforward. Building an image with Podman, it's the same thing. I just copied the slide and I added the text because really it takes a Docker file and it's, it's the same thing. It's a drop-in replacement for Docker, as I mentioned before. So uh, it has a build feature. It takes a Docker file. It just works the same way. Building with Builda. So Builda uh, is another project that we're going to, to introduce. It's, uh, it's capable of building with the Docker file. And to be, uh, to be fair, basically, Podman and Builda, they share uh, libraries together. So when you do a Podman build, you're actually using the same code that Builda is using when processing a Docker file. But Builda takes building in a different way, if you want. It allows you to be uh, more flexible in the way you are going to, to build an image. I'm going to show you uh, some, an example uh, instead of a demo part. The nice thing is that when you build a Docker image using a Docker build, or when you use a Podman build, you have a series of steps uh, for each comment that you write inside the Docker file. And at the end of each step, you have uh, a layer that is produced. So unless you pay close attention, unless you squash all the layers together, you can end up having uh, leftovers from, from previous layers. You can remove something from the latest layer, but these uh, bits are still going to be inside of one of the, of the foundation layers. With Builda, you can really produce images that have uh, no artifacts inside of them. You can even produce an image that doesn't have a package manager around at all, which is uh, maybe what you're looking for in some cases. Finally, there is Kiwi. So how many of you know Kiwi? All right, good. So Kiwi is the finest builder that we've been using at SUSE since uh, a long time. If you take uh, uh, a SLE installation media, if you spin up uh, uh, a SLE image inside of the public cloud, all these images, they have been built with Kiwi. So Kiwi has been extended to be able to build also uh, container images. 
to be fair, uh, KPI has a really steep learning curve. It's uh, pretty complex to, to, be, to be managed. So we are using that because it has some nice integration with the Open Build service, which is an open source project that uh, Suze is, uh, is leading. That is the place where we build all our <coughs> packages and where we build also all our appliances, images, whatever. And so it provides us some really nice feature, like whenever one of the dependency of the Docker image, container image is changed, the image will be rebuilt. And if this is a base image, sorry, if this is a, a derived image, and its base image changes, then again, the derived image will rebuild. So that allows us to keep our images always up to date. Um, so it's a pretty flexible for us, but to be completely honest, uh, I doubt a regular user would, uh, would embrace into, into this journey. All right, so it's, uh, it's demo time now. Um, if you have questions, of course, feel free to, to, to ask me, to interrupt. So when, when a container yeah, sure. when it gets rebuilt, is that a destructive rebuild or is it an additive rebuild? It's a disruptive rebuild, so that the layers do not keep growing and growing. This is how we do that uh, inside of the build service. But if you keep rebuilding with with a Docker build, you you add layers. You reuse <coughs> layers, you know, So if you reuse some layers and you add new ones on top of them. Okay. All right, so. I'm sorry for the ones who used Docker in the past, just uh, pay close attention. Um, so with Docker, mm -hmm. you can run containers in an easy way. So we run a container, we're going to spawn a shell inside of the container. We're going to use the one container that is called BusyBox. All right. That ruined almost everything. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, like that television. Uh, I'm really angry now. I'm really angry. Let me fix that. Just a second. Don't hate me. We're here for more. An error question so far. All right. All right, it's working. <coughs> I was pretty quick fixing that. <laughs> okay, it's running. All right, everything is there. So you can um, uh, you can uh, mount volumes from uh, from your machine. All right, so if I go under post, as you can see, there is the Docker file. All right, if I exit, I was able to write on my machine, so it's a way to store data, really simple one. Uh, another thing that you can do, um, you can do uh, run a service, for example. Uh, I'm running a container that has a web application inside of it. The web application is listening on this port, so I'm going to share a port between the container and the host. All right. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, so the application is working. Now it's not, it's given an error <coughs> because um, it needs a Redis database that is not running right now. So I'm going to show you. So this is the way I used to, it's running a container. This is the name of the container. It's, uh, <coughs> it's doing a port mapping. So port 400, 4000 inside of the container is exposed on the host on the same uh, port number. And this is the output produced by the container. The RM is just uh, when I kill the container, I don't want the, the container to be to be left around the, the system. So everything is uh, is pretty straightforward. Uh, we can also uh, build, all right? Uh, Suzycom. This is the new image. The name of the new image. 
and I build the image, all right? So everything is working fine. So why was I so angry when it didn't work in the beginning? Let me show you. All right. Oops. So it's running, all right? There is no Docker running. I was cheating. I've been using Podman the whole time. <laughs> so now I fix that. <coughs> I created an alias. All right. So <laughs> what I've shown to you is Podman is like using Docker. Really, it's the same thing. All right. But there is one thing that maybe you haven't got yet. And not root. So I was running all these containers in rootless mode. So I wasn't the root of a, of a system. I didn't have access to any kind of daemon that was uh, uh, allowing me to, to spawn containers. So all the time I've been just uh, using Podman. So you do Podman build, you do Podman run. Uh, I didn't do one thing, though. I didn't do Docker images because it works. But if you are a smart guy and look into the details, you will notice that the names are slightly different. Because with Docker, whenever you do a pool, like pool BusyBox, pool Alpine, whatever, you're pulling from the Docker Hub. With Podman, uh, you can configure that to pull always from the Docker Hub. But it's, uh, it's always explicit about uh, where the image is coming. It tells you it's coming from Docker Hub. If you do that with, uh, with Docker, you will just see like uh, open source leaf, so I didn't want uh, to, to spoil the fun. So as you can see, using Podman is really uh, like using Docker. Using that as rootless, uh, in rootless mode doesn't involve uh, any special action for you. It's just a single command that you have to run the first time you want to, to have it running on the system. So it's really, really easy. I want to show to you now the, the comp set of pods uh, that I mentioned before. So with Podman, uh, you have uh, the comp set of pods that are this way to group together different containers. So first thing, let's create a, a new pod. It takes a bunch of, uh, of, uh, of flags, all right? The most important one, I, oh, the most important one for me right now is um, let's give a name to the pod because it makes it easier to uh, to be managed. Managed. I'm going to name that guestbook, and I'm going to. You have to tell what kind of services are going to be running to the pod, and if any of them is is exposed, it needs to be exposed to the internet. You need to specify that at pod creation. So I'm going to run the guestbook. Again, so this is the, the port number. Oh, sorry. Ah, wrong order. All right. So now we have um, a pod that is running. Now we have to add some containers inside of it. So we do a podman run. By default, containers do not run into, into pods. So you have to specify the, with minus minus pod the, the name of the pod that you want to use. We're going to run uh, Radius, the Alpine version of it. And this is it. So now we have. We have radius running, okay. Inside of the inside of the pod, it has two containers running, as you can see. Um, this is because of how the network is handled. Uh, there is an infra container. This is the same way that Kubernetes does. If you're curious, you have a container that is not doing anything except uh, creating, uh, so being the network namespace container and all the other containers they join it. This is a bunch of a complicated topic. If you want, we can talk about that later. So next step, we run the guestbook. 
So we run a container inside of a pod called Gasbook. Yeah. Uh, it's go I don't need to tell it that it's going to expose any port because even if it's going to be inside of a pod that is already exposing ports, everything would just work fine. Uh, and give a name. And this is running. As you can see here, I'm creating messages, I'm removing them, everything is working because Redis is working. But there is a big difference here. <coughs> so my application, uh, the Gasbook, is configured to try to connect to a Redis instance that is running on local host on the usual standard Redis port. When I started Redis, I didn't have to specify anything. Redis, by default, the container will bind to local host on the, on the usual port. And this is just going to, to be there listening. Uh, when you're doing, if you try to do the very same thing with Docker we'll say, or with Podman without using a pod, we'll have an issue because localhost or Redis is uh, a different network compared to the localhost of a Gasbook application. Mm -hmm. And so they won't be able to communicate with each other. When you put containers together inside of the same pod, they share the network namespace, which is a fancy way to say they have the same IP address, they have the same networking stack. And localhost for both containers is the same one. So this is a really flexible way to, to run containers. And this is it about, uh, about Podman. The, the other thing that I want to show to you is how to, con to build a container using Builda. So with Builda, Builda can see the, the containers that are, run, that are created by Podman and vice versa. Builda can work in rootless mode as well. But to be fair, fairly honest, I have some problems on my machine. And it's a, it's a new feature, so I don't want to run into any more issues right now. So you can build using uh, a Docker file with a bud command, so build using Docker, uh, and it will just uh, work. Yeah. And as you can see, new 4 is there. Build also provides a way to manage uh, uh, to manage images, so I can do build uh, uh, remove image uh, new four and it's going to remove it. But um, let's take a look at the fancy way to create uh, containers with Builda, the more interactive one. So uh, you can do something like uh, Builda from a base image, like uh, let's use uh, BusyBox. This is going to create a container and it's going to return to me the ID of the container. Uh, I'm going to store that into a variable. All right, this is the name of the container. I can do build up containers, and I can see that the container is there. The container is not actually running. <coughs> I mean, it prepared the whole file system of the container and so on and so forth. What I can do is I can run something inside of the container. So I can do a build up, run, name of the container and the name of the program. Now I'm inside of the container. I can do a touch uh, full bar. I can run a make, I can run a script, whatever. Once I'm done, I just exit from the container. All right, and if I want, I can commit that and this is going to create a new image. But I can do another fancy thing. I can uh, ask a builder to tell me where the <coughs> container root by system is located. I can store that into an environment variable and do build a mount of a container. And this is the place where the container file system is mounted. So now, if for example, I move into this directory, I can see that there is the full bar file I created. But more important, I can do other things. I can say I'm not happy with foobar, I will remove it, I just remove that. Or I want to run a program like sad, 
that is not inside of the container, but is on my machine. I can run SAD to do changes inside the files that are uh, on the inside of the container. And then at the end of everything, commit that. Or what I can do, so just a second, so um, let's remove this container because we don't need it. All right. I will show you, let's see if it works. Yeah. So let's show you something more interesting. So let's create a new container. We build up from, this time not from an existing container, we start from a scratch container. Do you know what scratch is also with Docker file? This is basically empty. There is nothing in there, all right? We created that. I can't run anything in, inside of this container because there is nothing, there is no shell, nothing, nothing at all. So what I do, I'm going to mount that. All right, and then more recent versions of Zipper have a feature called uh, install root that tells Zipper, do not install things on my host machine, just install them inside of this directory. Consider this directory as the root file system, uh, look at what is missing in there and just uh, install stuff over there. I will tell it to use uh, leaf1500. Uh, this is something related. It's going to use the repositories of my laptop to install things. I'm going to install inside of this uh, scratch container, I'm going to install core utils package. Now there is the network over there. I hope it's going to be uh, it's going to be fine. It's going to refresh the repos on my machine. I hope it's it's not going to take too much time. The, the, the point is, what I'm going to end up with is a container that just has uh, core utils and a bunch of other packages. It will have a full usual file system layout, but it's not going to have zipper or RPM inside of it, so it's really stripped down to, to the minimum. And this is something that, from time to time, can be pretty, pretty useful. I guess the network is just uh, okay. So this is the list of packages that are going to be installed. It's quite some packages because I forgot to use a, an option of zipper that tells do not install recommended packages, but it's going through. All right, so now it installs all these packages into the container. And in fact, I can do build up, run inside of the container, bash. Here I am. I'm inside of the container that I was creating. I can try to do RPM minus QA to see the packages that are installed, but this is not working because there is no RPM because that, that was not installed. I just installed core utils and that's it. So I can exit from there and now I can do uh, build down, unmount of the container and then build down, commit a container into demo. And this is going to write a container that is 40 megabytes in terms of size because I forgot to, to use this zipper flag to not install recommended packages, so it could have been smaller. And this is here, and I can do podman run. Here I am. I have my container. So I have an image built with build up that is really minimal and I can share that with uh, with other folks because it has been built using the the, the container image specification and so it, it would even work with docker all right now um, I wanted to show you something but this is pretty complex I will just uh, glance over it you can even do something you know who have seen inception the movie yeah, you have to watch it several times to understand it, like, like this script, all right? <laughs> so this is a way to, to create containers with Builda using script. So you start with a bash script that is executing the comments that I've shown to you that is just doing that in an automated fashion. So I start with a scratch container. I mount that. And then with zipper, I install inside of this container, I install Builda itself. I installed zipper, I installed bash, some certificate packages, 
I add some repos to the container. <coughs> I, I do some tuning of, of build that configuration inside of the container. I add keys of the repository so that they are, they, I know they are trusted, I can trust them. Uh, oh, another nice thing I didn't show you uh, is I can copy files from the host into the container using a copy comment that is uh, more comfortable. Um, and basically what I'm doing is I created a build up container with build up. Then with this container, I can create other containers. This sounds really crazy, but uh, I know of customers that, for example, they have to build uh, container images. They want to do that on top of Kubernetes. And the only way to do that is to mount the Docker socket from the host into one of the containers that is run by Kubernetes. And as I mentioned before, if you, if you do that, you're just giving the keys of your system to, to whoever can, can run this kind of privileged containers. And this is uh, unsecure, but this is the only way that if you, if you want to build with Docker, this is the only way you have to, to go. <coughs> but uh, if you go with something like Builda, you can do building of containers within another container. So you can have your integrated CI system building containers, and you can spawn, for example, pods on top of Kubernetes. And inside of these pods, in a secure fashion, you can build images of your application. Once the build is done, you can push this uh, build artifact to your local registry and then consume that with your continuous delivery pipeline. So it was a bit of a funny experiment, but uh, it, it can also have um, <coughs> uh, an implementation and usage, all right? <coughs> it was just not for fun. Um, last thing, I want to show you another thing. Today at half past four, I have another talk about uh, bringing container security to the next level using Kata containers. How many of you have heard about Kata containers? All right. So for ones who didn't, Kata containers is, uh, is another run C implementation. All right. So it's at the bottom of the stack. It's a replacement for run C. Where run C creates containers using kernel directives. So these are processes that you can see on your machine. But as Mika said, containers do not always contain. So if you want to, be, to introduce an extra layer of security, what you can do is to wrap containers into, into VMs. But uh, an easy way to do that is I start a VM, I install Docker, build out whatever inside of the VM, and then I run all the containers in there. But this is not going to scale. With, um, with Kata containers, what you are going to do is you start one VM per container, and this is an optimized VM that has a reduced boot time. So uh, just to give you a glimpse, uh, for example, I can do with Podman, I can do a run. I tell Podman to use a different runtime to not use Q, uh, run C, but to use a uh, Kata container using the QEMU backend and to run an interactive session inside of a busy box image, uh, run the shell. So now it's, I have a shell running. All right. And if I go over there, You can see I have a QEMU process here running and QEMU light process. I will talk more about that later. But the point is uh, through the process of standardization, you can swap out all the different components. You can swap out Podman with, uh, um, with Docker if you want. You can swap out Run C with another runtime implementation like QEMU. Uh, it all, it's really flexible and it all tailors to your actual needs. So if you're interested in more about that, later today. Now, getting back to, to the slides, uh, we are basically running out of time. Um, another thing that is worth to be mentioned is that we have now a SUSE registry. So if you, you may have noticed if you need to pull images uh, of the SUSE products, they are going to be stored inside of this registry of SUSE.com. Um, and the way to install pack to, to, to download images is usually you have like a Kubernetes manifest file, or if you're using Kubernetes, you are using Helm. There are going to be talks about Helm during the week, so I suggest you to, to attend one of them. Um, using containers, however, brings back some problems that we already faced, like uh, uh, how many of you are running SMT or RMT or SUSE manager to mirror packages? Yeah. 
So if you are moving to containers, you will run into the same issue. How do I avoid all the net, all the machines inside of my network to download the same binary blobs over and over from the registry? Or how do I deploy containers into an air gap environment where I do not have network access? So we worked on a solution for that uh, called registry mirroring. Uh, it's available since CAS by 4 d 3 It's something that is flexible. It can be also used outside of it. We just did the first iteration of the RAID. We plan to extend it. And all the information about it are inside of the, of the SUSE CAS v 3 manual. There is a section about that with all the steps that you have to follow. So to give you a really quick overview, um, I would talk about the air gap scenario where you have hosts that can connect to the remote network, so it's the most complex one. Uh, you <coughs> should be able to pull containers from a local registry then, but what people are usually doing, they're pulling images from the registry, they're renaming them, and they're pushing them to a local registry. So usually the name of the image changes like from that to, to something like that, you know, which is kind of ugly. You have to be sure you change everything uh, or it's going to be a mess. So the solution that we came up with doesn't involve any kind of change like that. So we have an architecture where you have an external registry. You have a, a machine inside of the network that can reach the registry where you download <coughs> dump all the images. And then you copy all the images to a USB stick, whatever. You scan the, the USB stick. There are you know, people, government, like that need to scan everything and put that into the secure network, the air gap network. And in there, you just copy the images from the USB stick to um, a registry. And from there, the nodes are going to pull them. To do that, however, we have to do quite some changes. So we have, first of all, to come up with a tool that is going to mirror <coughs> power charts. These are best with instructions where to pull images and such. So we're going to mirror the Elm chart so that you can then deploy them inside of the air gap network as static files. And <coughs> to do that, we wrote a tool that is called Helm Mirror. And then we are using a tool that is called Scopio, that is a tool that is designed only to interact with images, like pulling and pushing images. We introduced a sync command that allows you to, for example, tell Scopio to download images from the registry, store them to a USB stick, and then copy from the USB stick into a registry. So this is how you get images from uh, the network, from a machine connected to the network, down into the air gap environment. And then we made a patch to, to the Docker engine. We are making a patch to Cryo uh, to, to be able to consume images from the local registry without having to change anything, basically mirroring support. Um, the patch is going to be available also inside of uh, Builder and Podman because uh, Cryo, Builder and Podman are using the same set of libraries. So once you do a change in the place, it shows up everywhere. Um, I would not spend too much time into that. I just uh, save that. And I will leave that to you, Michal. Well, no, that's, that's really just, uh, I want to encourage everyone to uh, re have a look at our container mm -hmm. sessions. So Flavio will have one on, on Kata containers later today. There are like, sessions on the CAS platform, there are sessions on Helm, Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes OpenStack combination, and stuff like that. So this is like, I picked uh, set here. If you want to go to another one, and there's even more content. So, so really, have a look. Go there and uh, don't forget there is a tech showcase. We have a kiosk there where we are showing uh, the CAD platform. Father will be there, I will be there, others uh, will be there as well. So you can have a look, get your hands on it, and ask questions. All right. I guess we are out of time. But so, yeah. <coughs> if you have questions, we will. Right, we'll we'll out, so. Thank you very much. <laughs>